tonight, we are delighted to welcome Gretchen Anderson to help us understand more about some of the things that are called soft skills, but actually are quite systematic when you consider them carefully. And so I'm, I'm excited to hear her talk about how to master collaboration. I think the last time I was speaking here was probably about 10 years ago, which is um, crazy to imagine. Um, one of the things I love about this community is how supportive it is for us to share what we've learned and um, be a good resource to each other. So I'm deeply appreciative of the kind of work that Baykai does and happy to be here tonight. Um, I do want to talk about collaboration. Uh, my background is as an interaction designer and product designer. Um, I've worked at places like uh, organic and then I went to Cooper and I worked at Frog Design and then I decided that I would get Lunar and I decided I would go in-house um, and now I've gone back to being an independent consultant uh, after writing this book on collaboration and you know really I think this was born out of uh, I, I did a stint at PG&E so we're all Californians we all know PG&E uh, my job at PG&E was to be part of a team that was gonna get rid of paper because it's on paper um, teach a 110 year old company how to operate in a more modern way, you know, all of the good stuff. Um, I loved the core job, but my job quickly became infect the rest of PG&E with this different way of thinking, and it was a lot. And I watched a lot of really well-intentioned executives say all the right things about working differently together and valuing collaboration and iteration and experimentation and hypotheses and all the other buzzwords that the agilistas have. And one uh, woman in particular was, was setting up a reorg, and she had us all come into a room and tell us how much she valued our opinions and how this is going to be a team effort and all the right things. And then the last five minutes of the meeting, she threw up the new org chart and said, what do you think? <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, I could, just, I could really help you out here. So it was really born out of helping more than just designers, really more executives, product managers, engineers, because I feel like as designers, we have some we are given and taught some tools about collaboration, mostly because our work goes nowhere if we don't collaborate, right? The engineer can design something and launch it into the world, but if I, my stuff is, you know, sits on a shelf if I don't collaborate. But I think that it's, it, you know, collaboration is about getting all of the people to do that. So tonight I want to talk specifically to people who are, you know, UX oriented people, but keep in mind, I'm going to have nuggets in there for you to teach and coach your other non-design UX friends um, to be better at working together. The, the subtitle of my book is Making Working Together uh, Less Painful and More Productive. Because as I started out on this journey, I started to realize like we have a very, it's complicated relationship with collaboration. We sometimes talk very lovely, lovingly about it, and then about half the people I talk to are like, oh God, not another brainstorming meeting. Like, I just can't with that. It sounds exhausting. Uh, it didn't work out last time. All that kind of thing. And it's interesting, because if you've had a good experience, so I mentioned I worked at Cooper and Frog were two places in particular where we really practice pair design. It's a very specific kind of collaboration, but it was really like two people really heads down on a problem. And it can be very wonderful, it can also be very trying. But the experience that I had and by being challenged by somebody over and over again and realizing it always got to a better place gave me a positive view of collaboration. But if you're somebody who just gets dragged kind of randomly into brainstorming meetings and then you go back again, you're like, I don't even know what this is. I'd rather just sit in my nice safe space and do what I know how to do and get done with all that messy people stuff. Um, which is unfortunate because I think you know there are a lot of good reasons we should collaborate. And before I launch into those, uh, this is a model um, that Kate Rudder gave me because it became clear to me I needed to define what I meant by collaboration, and I loved it so much I adopted it. Um, so on the one hand, you have this idea of just cooperative work. So most work that we do is cooperative, right? So a cooperative workplace is somewhere where it's like we're going to put up a fence. Someone's going to dig a hole. Someone else is going to put a post in. Someone else is going to put some things, some whatever these are called, and the slats. You know the order of operations. There's not a lot of ambiguity. Yes, things need to be coordinated and choreographed, but there's not a lot of uh, messiness. On the other end, you have that co-creation, almost that pair design thing I was talking about, where you have people who are really, really intimately involved in the problem. 
and who almost, like, one of the things I loved about working in pairs is you got rid of a lot of information overhead because it was two people the whole time. And when I say the whole time, nobody collaborates 24 seven or even like Monday, Friday, nine to five. We'll get into that more, but um, I'm not saying that you need to live your entire life like tied to 10 people, because that would be madness. But in the middle is what I would think of as collaboration, which is you have lots of different kinds of people. We always think about it's like cross-functional. Yeah, okay, so the designers, developers, product managers, researchers, electrical engineers, whatever they are. But also people with different perspectives. You also have different kinds of um, participation, right? You have some people who are really deep in it, in that core team. You have these like h highly, highly interested stakeholders who might even be on the hook for whatever y'all are collaborating about, some subject matter experts, and even people who kind of need to keep up with even if they aren't like informing or directly acting on this collaboration. And so that, that can be a lot. And understanding how to do this well and how to do it over time is something that um, is very difficult. And so I want to start by saying, it's, yeah, again, it's not something you're gonna do 24 seven. It's not something you're always gonna um, triumph at. Not every collaboration is going to go wonderfully. But there are things you can do to make them go better. And if you think about what a collaboration looks like when it goes bad, it's not like this team worked, 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 worked really hard and they did the wrong thing at the end. I mean, I'm sure that's happened. But more often, it's people started to work together, they couldn't really get any traction, and they kind of gave up and then just went back to their corners and had that bad taste in their mouth for the whole idea of collaboration, if not the specific people involved. Um, so that's really what I'm trying to avoid because collaboration is sort of critical to problems that have some of these qualities. So something like um, building a rocket or I don't know, I worked on a surgical robotics suite, like something that is sufficiently complex that you have to participate with lots of different kinds of people. The, the um, surgical robot, I think there were like eight different kinds of engineers, optical engineers, and mechanical engineers, and electrical engineers. and you know, there were just specializations upon specializations. But there were also uh, doctors, and there were like, you know, leading doctors who had done this for 20 years, and there were doctors who were just coming out of medical school. And needing to get everybody's different perspectives on this thing that was very complicated was important. Um, so it's, it's, if you have a straight ahead problem, you're probably cooperating. If you have a complex problem, you're gonna need to collaborate. And things that have a lot of ambiguity are also good places to bring in collaboration. Um, if you don't know what's really going to happen, you probably want to solicit a lot of different perspectives and a lot of participation because you can avoid face planning. Um, does anybody remember Lady Doritos? <laughs> no. Um, this is probably about a year ago. Doritos had done some really thoughtful user research. Um, they found out that women did not like eating Doritos in public. They are too loud and they leave that delicious powder all over your fingertips that you want to lick off, but that's not ladylike, and so women were like, not really, it's kind of weird. And the thoughtful researchers were like, no problem, we got you ladies, we're gonna make lady Doritos. They're less crispy with presumably less of the delicious powder. It's not a product I wanna eat. The problem with that effort was that they did not have a diverse enough collaboration, and I don't mean women. That sounds to me like a group of product people got together and did some research and didn't talk to any marketers or any psychologists or anyone who might have looked at that situation and gone, ah, oh, the user's problem here is patriarchy. The solution is not a new product, it is an ad campaign that shows women lustily enjoying Doritos and like getting over the societal taboo about this. Right, so bringing in things, different perspectives that help you not trip yourself up is part of what makes collaboration work. Collaboration is really good at getting alignment so we all have this problem, I know you do, because it's happened to me every day of my life where you have like eight different people telling you what to do and they are clearly not aligned. You are not going to fix that problem 100%, but you can make your life and everyone else's life simpler if you can help them get a, a sense of alignment. And you're gonna do that by having them participate. There's no other way to do it. Otherwise, they end up reciting their same buzzwords and bullet points over and over again or you guys are probably familiar with design thinking. You know what happens when you get people to start drawing a solution instead of talking about it. Suddenly people start going, oh, you meant that? 
I didn't mean I meant this. Oh, now we're talking, now we're collaborating. And then finally, engagement. You know, this goes all the way with, to employees. It can help employees get engaged. Uh, users can get engaged. Um, you could get people like legal and HR engaged when they're actually helping you make the thing and not just kind of responding to random requests. They're going to be more bought into the solution. Does that make sense? So if that's what it's good for, well, we have some hurdles in front of us. And I think it's part of what makes the relationship complicated. So as I did this book, I um, you know, drew on my own experience, but I went out and talked to, I don't know, 50 odd people who kind of do what we do. And this is sort of what I ended up hearing, that the buckets of, of issues that I ended up hearing. So it starts with the environment. So you know, corporate America, or just organizations in general, because it could be nonprofits, could be government, they favor independence and individualism. We are recruited individually, we are uh, rated individually, we're paid individually, we compete for ever decreasing jobs. The whole environment is set up for you as an individual to stand apart from your peers. In some places, like maybe not anymore, but like Microsoft used to really like force that even, right? They would like rank, stack rank people and kind of have people compete for, for performance reviews. So that's toxic to collaborating. Um, Everyone I spoke to was like, you know, the number one thing you got to have is really clear objectives. I'm like, sounds awesome. What do you do to set really clear objectives? Well, gosh, I probably don't spend enough time on that. Because too often what we do is say, we've got something we got to go after. Some executive dumped this in somebody's lap, or there's a situation we're responding to. The, the um, tendency to act is there. And so we all kind of go, we know what we're doing, right? Let's just, let's just get started. And then you get to some point, and people say, well, is, what, is the thing we made any good? And then the fight starts to happen, because you didn't define good up front. You didn't set clear objectives. So now you have a food fight, and everyone's mad. And you got to recover from that or give up. Uh, we love experts. We love to just say, this person is an expert in this area. Executives love this, because they have to make, I, I empathize. If you're a busy senior leader who has to make a lot of decisions in a lot of different domains, you rely on experts to give you good advice. But if that's what's leading your decision making, you're going to end up with non-collaborative answers, right? You're going to end up, well, the expert said, this is why people, you know, the lawyer said whatever. Cool, if that's a perspective that the lawyer had, can we talk about some other perspectives? So how do we get better at making decisions that are not just driven by this sort of expertise and individualism? And then finally, it's just poor communication. Not, I'll get into this more, but you know, we just are not, um, we don't have good models for communicating collaborative efforts. Again, it gets back to some of that independence thing. It's really difficult to say, here's what the group thinks, here's what the group diverged, here's what the group failed. Um, it really becomes more like, we're, we're very used to just saying, here's the answer we came up with. Do you like it, yes or no? And that's not an effective way to communicate. So then I turned that on its head and sort of said, OK, well, there's sort of things you can do to combat each of those areas. And um, these are just the different chapters from the book. But I, um, I'm going to talk to you about some specifics from a few of these that I think you know, should be salient to this group. And um, you know, there's more in, in the book. But I think there's some basic things that you can do right away to help your collaborations go better. So the first one is enabling trust. And it um, sounds obvious, right? You have to trust a team in order to get anywhere with them. But as I looked around on the internet, there's like a lot of platitudes. There's a lot of like HBR articles with like the five things you can do to build trust, and they're like really not very helpful. Um, I interviewed Jimmy Chin, who is the director. Did anybody, does anybody know the movie Free Solo? Yeah, so he, um, I asked him because he not only collaborates with you know, his climbing partners, who they put their lives in each other's hands, he makes movies with his wife. So Free Solo is the story of Alex Honnold, who climbed El Cap without a rope um, about two years ago. And no, I mean, he, the guy lived. It's still a thrilling movie. Um, I'm not giving anything away by saying that. Um, but I wanted to know, you know, what is, are there parallels that we can learn from here? And so, you know, he, Jimmy is an elite athlete making a crazy movie with other elite people. He's choosing his team among the top 10 whatever, rock climbing cinematographers in the world. 
we don't have that luxury, right? Often you're like, well, this is the team I got, <laughs> and I got to do with it what I'm going to do. But I think there are some things you can do, which is think about how you can incubate trust. So if you have a team that has people that have worked together before, know that that's a seed. Because those two people have some experience together. And they're going to have a level of trust, and they're going to model what it looks like to trust one another so that other people will start to understand that and other people will start to see what that looks like. Um, or if you have a team that's very high performing, think about splitting it up and infecting other teams with those little, and don't do it, send them two by two, give them a partner. Send those little nuggets out to spread the love because the trust really comes from experience. Because once you have experience with somebody, it's that you know, oh, you're good over here, you're weak over there. You're a really strong coder, you're, you're not a documentation guy. And that's okay. I'm not gonna try to make you a documentation person. I'm gonna focus on what you're good at and we're gonna talk openly and honestly about the fact that what are we gonna do with this hole over here, right? Where you can start to have an honest conversation based on where you know working together where people are strong and weak. And you can start to say, we know what we're capable of together. Here's who else we need or the other kinds of people we need. And you might need to do this. I always talk think about the first pancake because um, the first pancake in my house is a really ugly creation. I don't have the, the butter's too hot, and I have some lumps that I hadn't seen. Um, it's a perfectly edible pancake. So it's good to think about seeding teams with like make a first pancake. Like give them a low stakes effort to do together where they can learn what they are capable of and they can make mistakes without being exposed too much. There's no other, without the experience, there's no other way to do it. And you want to do it in a way where, where the stakes are not so high that somebody is going to revert to really defensive behavior when they feel exposed. So I'm a big fan of first pancakes. And first pancakes as an idea I use all the time of like, it's just the first one. You can make more. I know I, it's almost like when people, call, when people say MVP, I almost think what they mean is the first pancake. Um, OK. <laughs> um, the second idea is about the use of space. So I spoke about the kind of environment of, of the business world um, is not really conducive to collaboration. And some of that is about the literal spaces that we use. And. The first thing is, and I mentioned this a couple times already, this is not about being tied to the hip for six months to a group of people that you can never ignore or leave. <laughs> um, you know, I see, I've seen enough of these digital transformation things where they'll set up pods of agile teams and they're all sitting together and they're all like can wheel their chair around and talk to one another. And there's something really cool about that. Um, it's also really hard to make get a clear separation between I am now doing my work as an individual and I'm now collaborating. And so I think the thing we tell ourselves is, it's so convenient, though, that I can just turn around and start having a conversation. Not everyone might be ready for that, right? Somebody might be right in the middle of a big thing they're trying to do that's kind of complicated, and now is not the time to interrupt them. So thinking about having space where you all go collectively to be together, and space where you can all go to be on your own. So at Cooper, we would have this kind of cadence of from, you know, whatever, nine to noon, We'd be in a room with the whiteboard hammering out the design. What are the assumptions? You know, what use case are we working on today? And then after lunch to the end of the day, we would individually work on, I'm going to draw this thing, you're going to write that thing, and divvy up the actual work to be done. And that is helpful to keep your uh, sanity and to keep you from kind of circling the drain of discussing and revisiting assumptions over and over again. Um, when I went into this whole space thing, I was very biased towards in-person meeting, you know, co-located synchronous communication is always preferred if you can make it happen. And I talked to many people who shared that perspective. And then I got to the people who are either like fully remote teams or who are working in these environments where there's a lot of asynchronous communication. And I really kind of came around in my thinking to the value of asynchronous communication. So it's not so much about whether you're co-located or remote, it's are you supporting both synchronous and asynchronous communication? And what I mean by that is, um, actually, uh, Daniel Lovejoy from Microsoft's um, like AI and ethics group does a great talk about this, but 
um, he sort of points out that most business decisions are being that are being made in these meetings. You know, you're biasing it towards really extroverted people who are good at running a room. Who you're time boxing it. You're like, we're going to make these three decisions in this 30 minutes. Somebody's tired or sick. You you have factors that are biasing your decision making that we are completely ignoring. And the asynchronous communication really allows for people who are non-native speakers of whatever the primary language are, people who are introverted, people who are not real-time processors actually can participate in the activity. So I, I had a guy that worked for me for a long time. We would have these meetings. We'd go through everything, and I'd have a little list written out. And then the next day, I would come into like a seven-page email of all of the things he didn't tell me the day before. And I'd realize, oh, we did not actually reach consensus in that meeting. He agreed to everything because I'm a fast talker and I can push people around. But he needed to go home and think about stuff. And I realized after I got annoyed the first few times that like, oh, there's a wealth of information here that I'm going to miss if I don't make space for this type of communication. So um, if you hear like Amazon white papers is a new thing. Have you anybody heard of these? Uh, Google's been doing it too. It's this idea of like instead of having a bunch of slides where somebody like myself is up here running the show and, and controlling the narrative, have the team write a position paper, three, five page paper outlining the information, you know, the research you've done, the information you know, the assumptions you're making, the things you want to do, whatever it is, state your objective. And you can circulate that for people to digest, challenge, clarify ahead of time. And you can prioritize the synchronous time for like, OK, what is the stuff we really need to hash out together? And that gives that decision, that discussion, more room in that asynchronous communication. So like, you know, marking up Google Docs or whatever is an example of this. Slack is sort of an example. I think people use Slack a little more synchronously than asynchronously, really. But um, I really have come around in valuing that asynchronous communication and, and thinking about ways to support that. Um, I use Mural for um, non-co-located whiteboarding. And that's another, like, it's synchronous, but it's remote. And it's a very different experience. And it's not necessarily a negative one. Um, because I actually can't run the room. Or it's harder for me to run the room. Um, this is just kind of a funny two by two, because like, people, are, I talk, they, they, people are very religious about this whole thing. You know, like, we're super efficient when we can just get together here in the upper left. Like, we just get into a room, we just figure it out. And you're like, yeah, I don't know how quality that decision was, like, keeping metrics on that. As opposed to, like, you know, you could meet in a distributed team at a lower fidelity over a video conference or a shared whiteboard and still have a synchronous communication. And it's not necessarily any less efficient. Um, on the other side, they're sort of like, well, even if we're co-located and we're talking asynchronously, you know, we build our understanding over time, and we have these water cooler conversations. We love to play up the value of water cooler conversations when we think about co-locating people. Um, but the price on that co-location or that synchronicity is sometimes like, can you get the right people together? Is it are you, again? Are you biasing towards who is there for the meeting? Who's or who does time did we? Did we value over other people's, right? We said, well, we don't care about your time. We, we really need these three people's input over here. Um, so breaking apart that model of, of having it all, you know, having the, when you Google a, a stock image of collaboration, it's always people with post-its in a brainstorming meeting. And like, that's not the whole of it. That's a moment of it. Um, okay, the third secret of five is this idea of using roles. Um, I'm from Oakland. I'm not a sports person, but as I understand it, the uh, Warriors make interesting use of uh, unconventional roles. So that's that graphic. Um, going back to this image, you know, I want to talk about roles both for that kind of close collaborative team as well as the wider circle. Um, I mentioned a couple times pair design, so I wrote a book with Chris Nossel for O'Reilly on pair design, if you want more on that. Um, really that idea of, you know, at Cooper or Frog, it was two people. And they, we called those roles different things, but they were very similar to this in both cases. This idea of someone as a navigator and the other someone or somebodies. I've done this with up to five people. I wouldn't make your close collaborative group much bigger than that. Um, you know, you need a, a navigator and then you need some drivers. And the idea is that the navigator says, I know what the long arc is. 
I'm keep, keeping track of what problems we're going after. I'm keeping track of the criteria we said were important. I am um, moving the team along when they need to and keeping pace, as opposed to drivers who are then free to say, what if we did it like this? What if we did it like that? Almost like a design sprint, right? Or a charrette, or what, you know, pick your um, design term there, where you're just quickly trying out ideas. And you're doing it, and again, in a safe space where you can quickly say, this is not going to work. And now we don't have to take that down. And we know why it's not going to work. And the navigator's helping keep track of like, oh, we, we thought about this. That, here's why that's not going to work. Because so many times, and I think you guys have all had this, you show up at the meeting and you've done all of this work, but you show up with your answer. Ta-da! The big reveal never works. But we all do it. Here's the answer. And somebody's like, did you try it with it on the left with the green? And you're like, oh, yeah, we totally did. Did you try it with pink on the right? And you're like, yeah, we did. Oh, yes, we did all of that. But you didn't set that up. You just said, here's what we came up with. So if you have these roles, you can show a little bit of your progress and your rationale. You'll have more data to back up your solutions. And then there's like racy daisy models, which I find very helpful. I have sort of adapted the names because neither of the specific names from those worked for me. But when I've used this to good effect, this is more when you have sort of the idea of stakeholders and the core team, where you have someone who is, you know, the decider. There's someone who's probably a senior leader, an executive, who's on the hook for the outcome of your work, right? If the work succeeds, they get some love, and if it fails, they're in some trouble. That is different than the person that I call the advisor or someone who's like more of the day-to-day -day running the effort or you know the core team that's, that's leading the effort or their advisors, right? That's really what you're doing. And I think you know, a lot of designers like to think of themselves as like, oh no, we, are, we can design business and that's a whole other topic. But at the end of the day, we are advisors to those who hire us. I am not running this business. I'm providing you my expertise. I'm advising you. You, Mr. Mrs. Decider, can choose to ignore me at your peril or not, right? But, but th being clear of that separation is important. Um, people also love to kind of rush past the contributors and the informed, oh yeah, all those other people. Well, let's be clear, the contributors here are doing the actual work, so let's make sure you really get clear on like, do we have the right people there doing that work? And let's make sure we know who needs to be informed and not just assume we're gonna inform randomly or haphazardly because the thing that takes down a lot of collaborations is somebody wasn't told. And then they have it in for you. They get out their little arrows. And they're like, that thing has to go down because they didn't ask me. They didn't tell me what was going on. So roles are a great way to channel people's natural um, competitiveness and their natural need to focus. Uh, okay, number four is um, talking about the subjective. So I mentioned everyone says they're really important. And OKRs is like, Last year's hot topic, I think. I'm not going to get into that. Read Christina Wacke's Radical Focus. It's a really good book. But I do want to talk about just the idea of objectives in particular. Um, so I, I spoke with a uh, ER doctor because I, you know, I wanted to research not just how technology and product companies do collaboration. And I was super excited to hear like nitty gritty stories of like ER nightmares collaboration. And he looked at me and was like. <laughs> There is no time or space for that. Like, we do not haggle over who's in charge. There is a protocol. There is a person who is in an emergent situation whose life is on the line. And it is extremely focusing. And I was like, oh, wow. We could all use some of that urgency in our objectives. And business is urgent. And like, I'm sure like somebody comes to you and is like, I need this like yesterday. I don't mean time pressure urgency. I mean literally like, what? would happen if you did nothing. So it's very clear in the ER, if I did nothing, this person will die. Well, what would happen if you did nothing? What is the true urgency behind this effort? Is it profit driven? Is it you know, improvement? Whatever it is, get really clear for yourselves. It will not be given to you, right? You will be given things like increase engagement by 2%. Most useless metric in the world, yet we all live and die by it, and no one's got a better one. So I'm like, you're not going to get rid of engagement metrics, but you, for the team, could say, let's come up with something that is more useful and make sure we know what's at stake. Um, we all talk about outcomes over outputs, but so many times the objectives I see people operating against are really about 
outputs. Deliver the thing by Q3. Um, design, you know, ship the design language. Get this feature done. The outcomes are really more like, what is the world you, what's going to be different in the world when this thing gets out there? Better, for better or for worse? What are you really trying to make happen? And maybe what are you trying to avoid? Right? What are some abuse cases? And that will help you get to some sort of urgency that should be more actionable. Right? Like, so I, I take a crap all over engagement metrics because they're just not very actionable as designers. They don't tell you, they don't give you any indication of which direction to go in. Uh, it's a fine, like, you know, KR, I guess, but um, you as a team could ask yourselves to define better actionable objectives for yourselves. Okay, yeah, yeah, engagement. What do we think engagement's about? Engagement is, so, so if you were working on FDA.gov, minutes on site, time on site is like the stupidest metric. Like, I get it at Facebook, but like, a better metric is like, I got the information I needed and I'm a happy person who got on with my life. That's more often the metric that we're dealing with. So I think you for yourselves, and you don't have to like go tell your boss that they did the objectives wrong, but you for yourselves as a team could say, let's come up with our own statements of objectives and outcomes that help us stay oriented. You know, and maybe, maybe they creep into your stakeholder presentations and you start changing the way they think about outcomes and outputs and objectives, but at least for yourselves. Um, so that you avoid the food fight when you're coming together to review work. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make keep this short. Um, so this, I interviewed a musician uh, from Wilco, and he told me this story. So this is like on some, at some famous New York uh, sound studio. And it's this idea of like you go into the studio and you do a take and it's amazing, it, but there's like, oh, it's like a couple mistakes. So you're like, all right, let's try it again. And you're like, oh, no, it didn't have the groove. Like, try it again, try it again, try it again, until you see kind of, you, know, you go down, and you're like, you're like, oh, it sucks, it's catatonic, oh, fuck. And then at some unspecified, unmathematically quantifiable time, you start to hit it, you, you come back to it. And I put this in here to say, it, you have to hang on to your idea of what ultimate success is. It's so tempting when this happens, and it happens slightly differently, I think, in our work than in music, but it's so tempting when you hit this, like, crap point to be like, oh, I'm tired, it's fine, it's good enough. Let's just like declare victory and move on. And you have to do that on some level of like, hey, the sprint's over and we gotta ship something. But we're gonna keep at it until we get back, get the groove back, man, right? And that means like hanging in there for the long term and knowing that your collaboration is gonna take a while before it actually, this is not Braveheart. You're not gonna be like, I am the guy who sets us all free. Um, I, I tell a story when I, I one of the, projects I worked on at Cooper was uh, a credit card's first website. So like the first time you're going to pay your bill online and all of that. And we did all our little design work and we showed up and we had a meeting with the suits and they were literally called the suits. They were the finance people. And we got to the feature where we said, and you're going to email Val and tell her when her bill's due. And the guy literally laughed out loud and said, do you know how much money we make on late fees? We're not emailing people to tell them their bill's due. And like, we were like, but the persona and the poor, she's a single mom and like empathize. And then the guy was like, just no, uh -uh, absolutely no way. But like nine months later, they were doing exactly that because probably five other people had that conversation with them and the market moved in that direction. And the next thing you know, everybody is doing that. So this is just me saying like, it's okay if you don't win the first fight. This is a, it's, what is it, a marathon, not a sprint. And then lastly, just to talk about um, communication, is to think about the storytelling that you're employing. So if you think back to those stakeholders that are coming in on some cadence, and hopefully it's a regular enough cadence, they are not living it the way you are. Right? They, you saw them three weeks ago or three months ago, and now you're here today. And you need to remember, as much as they love you and think your thing is important or not, they don't remember. They don't remember what you said last time. They don't remember what they agreed to. They don't, they, I mean, I literally know executives, they live their lives in like eight minute increments. It's crazy, right? They're like, and they're talking about like internet security in one meeting and like catering the next officer's meeting in the next session. So you have to bring them along 
And storytelling is a good way to do this, and there's much more about this in the book, but um, Christina Wacke gave me a lot of this material. Um, she brought up that uh, as a researcher at, at Stanford, he says, we're hardwired for stories. He's got the fMRI data to show. If people aren't given a story, a by story, I'll just make this real clear, right? The, the hero's journey, you, there's an inciting event, you go along, there's a climax, you triumph, and there's a denouement. That structure, if you don't give it to people, they will create it. They will t leave out information, invert information, invent information. This explains a lot about what's going on, on the internet right now. If you give them, if you don't give them a story or you give them a believable story, they are much more likely to follow you. And the thing that you are all leaving out of your stories, even if you, every time I do storytelling workshops, people are like, but I already know this stuff. And I'm like, uh-huh. Not using it at work though. You know it because you watch it. You know it because you consume stories. So as consumers, we all get storytelling. But at work, we are leaving out the oh shit moment. I guarantee you are doing this. Because I've done it. Um, how many user scenarios have I written that's like, Janie wakes up in the morning and she grabs her great new product and she goes through her life and it's great. Literally the most boring story. Why am I doing that to myself? No wonder they don't remember the last thing I told them. They had no emotional hook. So think about, in, you know, user scenarios are great for this. User stories are great for this. What's going to be the oh shit moment? How do you paint the, 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 either the user's problem or showing how you help them recover when everything doesn't go right? Avoid abuse cases. All of those moments that will get people more hooked into what you're communicating with them. My other big tip is um, previously on Moss. Do we all remember that show? It's like a stock thing now. I'm sure that there's like a term for this. But right, previously on Lost, it'd be like, Joe went into the cave and found the button and was pushing it over and over again. Now with the, the front of every serial TV show, there is that recap. You should do that for your stakeholders. You should keep track of what you told them last time, reset that expectation, Revisionist history it if you want to, because like I said, they're not going to remember. If, some, if you need to retcon some stuff, like you do that. That's your time to do it. And you see TV shows do that, right? Sometimes they have like scenes, or they'll put in scenes to call attention to stuff that you want, they want you to pay attention to in the episode coming up. You want to do the same thing. Remember, we talked about Janie's need for X and Y, and then later in the session, you're, you're tying back to that. So that's going to help you be a little stickier. And this is going to take some doing, but in the long run, it's going to save you some time. This is like a job. It's not necessarily a full-time job, but I, I like to give somebody the job of historian. Often I do it, I have the navigator do this, who is explicitly responsible for keeping track of where the story has been and where it's, it's like a showrunner. Where's the story been and where is it going? And they're holding that thread for the team and for the stakeholders because the story does not write itself. So I was mentioning Jimmy Chin, so he, this movie, uh, Free Solo, about the guy that climbed El Cap with no ropes. The first movie that they did was called Meru, and it's a story of climbing this crazy Himalayan peak. They tried twice. Um, there's literally, like, f I'm seeing some nodding heads. There's like four near-death moments in this. I mean, the, the story has you on pins and needles. But when he first had his rough cut and he met his now wife, Chaya Vazzarelli, and he showed it to her, she was like, <sighs> This is dudes climbing. This is not a story. Like even though it had all of the same stuff in the story, it did not have the storytelling techniques to bring the emotional connection. It took her adding that layer, right? So he's a cinematographer, she's the storyteller, together they make magic. But that's a job. And so making sure you're really paying attention to what is the story we're telling and are we being um, clear about that. So that's our five secrets. Um, and I've you know, shared stuff to help you get past this idea of being overly uh, individualistic. And I really think about interdependence. I think about collaboration as like a buckyball or something, right? That, could we get better at being more resilient and having lots of connections to each other instead of what I think you hear a lot of like the agile people are all about like, well, have your teams work really independently. And I totally get that impulse. But if they can't at some point come together, like in a world full of connected services and APIs, you, we, ha we can't just, I mean, you've probably seen where this lies. At PG&E, you have 8 million redundant systems for exactly that reason, because this group did this one, and that group did this one, and nobody talked. So how do we get more inter interdependent with better objectives and kind of 
get rid of some of the experience, the expertise, domination, and poor communication by focusing on, you know, correcting the environment. I, I, I um, am wary of like, you're not going to change corporate America's environment fully. <laughs> um, and I know because I tried, and then I realized like, oh my God, this is insane. Culture <laughs> happens by the doing. It, it, you can't make culture happen. So the change you want to see in the environment, if you focus on how to be inclusive and give roles and get trust and make space, those are all things that will go toward changing that environment. And I almost think about it like a temporary autonomous zone. Like you're just carving out a bubble of collaboration space for a period of time. It's going to collapse when you go away. That's fine. You'll go make another little bubble for yourselves and give yourselves safe space. Um, you can set your vision. And um, really thinking, I mean, I think this third box is really what we know. This is the double diamond of like explore widely and know how to make decisions and then um, thinking about how you communicate. Um, and we're doing this because increasingly we have things that are more complex and ambiguous and we need better alignment and better engagement um, across the board so that we avoid face plants and kind of fix this broken relationship here. So. I have some copies with me if you would like to take a look or you want to buy one, they're on Amazon. If you're interested, check out the book. But I'd love to hear, um, every time I do this, I think what's mostly interesting is people tell me, you know, here's my situation. So I'd love to hear any questions or challenges you guys have. Exactly. I, I want to do um, click and clack for collaboration, like car talk. See, I'm looking like, oh, not half the room is like, I have no idea what you're talking about, lady. But I know, it's so great, right? Point and click. Thanks for the great presentation. I wanted to take your um, perspective on the way Apple operates as being um, internally, uh, in particular, and external being very secretive between the departments. Um, what is your take on that? And why they continue to succeed? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, Apple gets lauded for the what do they say? Like they never do any user research and they're such a great design company and I'm like both of those things are not true. I feel like they're a great engineering company and they, they don't maybe run research the way that we're used to but they are definitely out there listening to what people are doing and thinking and needing. I think the idea of th that vision of like Steve Jobs autocratically blessing or slamming down ideas um, was probably a true one but before that moment, I mean, he's just being the decider. And he's being the person who, I mean, he was the guy that said, this, was it the iPhone or the iPad? I forget, he delayed it for two years. Like, he was the guy who said, this is not ready, and I'm gonna be brave enough to say, I'm not shipping crap, we're not doing that. And that is a way of supporting a team that was probably very collaborative in small groups. Um, I think the fact that Apple is very segmented within its um, self comes out in its user experience. You know, it's those products are intended to do one thing really well, and just take a look at Pages, Keynote, like it's a hot mess of duplicative stuff. Um, you know, I think Apple doesn't get social for that reason. Like Apple Music, it's like we're all roommates. And I feel like the mental model for being social is teenagers in a dorm room where you're like, I'm, I have little kids, I need levels of permission. Like this, it doesn't work for me, right? So I think that Apple does some things well and um, Netflix is another example that people really hold up. I don't know enough about Netflix, but that's something they talk about a lot, is that's a really big value in the company, is being collaborative. Yeah? Um, and that's about um, incenting people, right? So this is um, great, but the reality is at the end of, I don't know, six months or something, you're sitting in front of your boss, you have a performance review, and they're like, so what did you do that was different from your, your peers? And that's the reality. So I think while you've equipped us as individuals with tools, like there is a systemic piece to it as well. So I was just curious how 
um, how that can evolve or how, how that plays into the whole dynamics? Yeah, it's a big topic. Um, hopefully, the person that you report to has asked or invited you to be part of a collaboration, hopefully. So at least they understand the value. And it's probably worth, along the lines of setting objectives, it's probably worth talking about up front how the evaluation is going to go at that level. Because you're absolutely right. You don't want to be sitting there at performance review time and having them say, which part of this did you do? That said, that's already true. You already don't do anything by yourself. So I don't know, like that's a, a little bit of a false dichotomy to me. I think that by saying that you're entering into this collaboration, it gives you an avenue to have the, the conversation about, are we gonna, here's how we're going to judge this. We're going to judge this by the outcome in the market. We're going to judge this by you know, whatever your KPIs are. And probably we're going to judge this by some amount of team health. Like how, how much trust is there? How much respect is there? Um, do you have a good story that you can tell about how you all work together? Um, I teach uh, undergrads too, and they hate group work with a hot passion. And I was like, I just wrote a book on collaboration. I'm sorry, you can't do individual projects solely. You have to do some group projects. Like that's, you're, guess what? You're going to go to work, and the first thing you're going to have to do is work in a team. And the thing that they fear is that one person is not going to do all the work. Um, so there's just a slight gender um, angle to this as well, right? As women, I think we like to own the fact that we collaborate, whereas we see a lot of individualistic behavior, you know, um, supported and rewarded from the other aspect too. So I think it's a very complex thing, right? I think we all want to say be collaborative, but it, I want to see the system reward that in some ways so that, you know, it's... Yeah. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I wish I, I wish I could tell you how to overthrow patriarchy. Really do. I, I don't have the answer other than I think that is a really healthy conversation to be having in your team, with your manager. And again, I would just focus, laser focus on we said we were going to achieve X and we did. Or we achieved X minus whatever, right? Um, and make it less about here's what I did. Here's what we did. Again, that's what you're doing. Anybody who's walking around saying, I did, it's like, I built this. Not, not, not all by yourself, you didn't. And I think any manager worth their salt is going to know that. Uh, that said, and part of the reason I broke up all those areas the way I did is you will never be able to tackle all of this, right? So if you're in, if you're in a highly individually incented environment and that's not going to change, you need to decide whether you can deal with that or whether you just say, okay, I'm going to have to play that game later, and maybe you all write your, out your own individual things that you did for your performance review theater as an agreement. Like, that's a way to get through that. You know, focus where you can move the needle, is what I would tell you. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my question is, I'm a designer, and one of the problems that I'm facing right now is how do you collaborate more effectively with software engineers who kind of act like pseudo interaction designers and um, like I value their opinion and their perspective but in a lot of what in um, some ways it seems as if it kind of overpower um, the decisions that I make as a designer. Yes and that is a very familiar dynamic to probably many of the people in the room. Um, you know one thing I would say is maybe they have Maybe they are good designers, or occasionally good designers, and that's fine, right? Like when they've come up with a decent idea, you can start by being like, "Yeah, that's actually a pretty good idea," or, or even better, that seems like a good idea. Just like I don't know that my idea is going to win, I don't know that your idea is going to win or lose. Let's try it out, and you know, have the team be about making it win with users, right? Whether again, it's engagement metrics or surveys or whatever it is, keep everybody focused on that rather than my idea didn't win. I think a lot of designers get really hung up on having the idea that they then give to the developers who then make it and never, the, never any gray area there. I think with a lot of the tools coming out, there's more and more prototyping that you can do to advance your ideas more toward code. And there's more and more things that coders are doing to learn about design. 
So it can be a team effort. I would not get too hung up on mine versus theirs. And I think if you model that, you start to build that trust. And you know, like I said, you, I, I don't know how long you've been doing this, but I know when I first started, when I see in, in a lot of designers just getting started, and maybe you guys see this too, is like they can have a million ideas. It is much harder for them to be able to articulate or know which ideas are good. But over time, you do develop that sense and that experience. And so it becomes easier for you to know when somebody, it's not always developers, sometimes it's executives, right? It's, well, here's my really stupid idea. And I've really gotten out of the business of trying to argue them out of it pro forma. I just say, sure, let's, let's try that out then. Right? I can whip up a prototype. Let's just see. Because I have also come up with the world's greatest idea only to prototype it and be like, that is literally the worst idea in the world. And I had to make it to realize my own limitations. So um, I think if you can model that open-mindedness about your own ideas, you can show them how to be that way about their own. Thank you so much. I feel like I don't, I don't keep track of how many good ideas I've had, but I think coming tonight was one of the best <laughs> ideas of the week so far. We'll give you some points. Yeah. Um, you're, you're hitting on so many things that are super relevant for me and my org right now. Um, and I'd love to get a copy of the book and all that. Um, but you said a couple of interesting things. Um, I've mostly worked on the client side. Big corp. I've worked for some startups, but like big corp, like enterprise, Fortune 100. And I'm just wondering from your experience, you mentioned Cooper, I've worked with Cooper, great folks. Uh, you mentioned Frog, I've worked with Frog, great folks. And have you thought about like a compare, contrast, what made the experiences around collaboration at Frog and Cooper, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but successful, and in the big corps, PG&E, any of these big businesses, so challenging. Yeah. Is, is there, I don't know if there's an unlock, is there a secret sauce? I mean, I, I have some assumptions about what that might be. And it might be something back to this incentives piece. Because if I'm, if I'm in collaboration with other UX research design, like-minded folks, even a great product team, the, the friction or the, the greasing the skids to have great collaboration happens. Yeah. And enterprise side, it's, maybe it's just a, a symptom of like the construct of the org and how they operate, but it seems like it's seeded with all these different friction points where it could be very smooth. So this yeah. whole change is um, significant. So I don't know, I could keep talking. Yeah, but I, no, I think. The agency the, enterprise thing is what I'm kind of interested in. I think in. that, you know, I think the pendulum swings back and forth between going and finding agencies and building up internal teams. And I think every time it swings toward we're just going to build up the team ourselves, eventually the organization comes around to there's something about bringing in fresh perspectives and having the ability to expand and contract the workforce that makes it nice to draw on agencies. So I think there's that mechanism in place that's actually helpful to bring a blend. I will also say, I feel like when I walked in, you know, when I was applying at pg and &E, everyone was like, oh, your, your resume is amazing, it's so great. And I walked in the door and it was like none of that mattered. Because the first meeting, there, every meeting starts out with, I'm Greg and I've been here for 25 years and I'm Lisa and I've been here for 14 years. I'm Gretchen, I've been here for six months. They do not care about me. I would have to have been there for double digits to get the right kind of credibility. So there's something about being an outsider. In fact, they've hit me up and been like, would you please come back and do that work as an outsider because you'd probably be more successful. Um, so I think that that's another aspect. And I will also say at both Frog and Cooper, there was not just the dedication to supporting those teams with the dedicated focus that were at least pairs, if not quads. There was a real focus on the outcome. Like Hartman Essinger is a crazy man. But he will say, all he cares about is, that you, does your thing succeed in the market? He doesn't care that it was done. He doesn't care that your client loves it. He wants it to be a success in the market. And he's laser focused on that. And sometimes that's hard to do when, especially making physical product, where you're not even going to know until so long before, right? Like that, it's not like an agile experiment where you're going to get data the next day. But he was still focused on how do we know that this is really the right thing to do. And that is very helpful. And so to the extent that you can channel that and get leaders to channel, I care about the outcome, not the output, 
you're going to get a lot farther because so much of big corp stuff is people ticking boxes, right? I remember at PG&E, everybody loved a process flow because that was how you governed everybody. And then I was wandering around one day and I found the process flow to make process flows. I was like, ah, oh, I fall into the 13th and a half floor. Like, what's going on? Meta, no. totally meta. Yeah, because that's all they know, checklists and process flows. And so I'm modeling it as um, a focus on outcome and focus on stories, right? Like storyboards and scenarios are great prototyping tools early on to get people out of the three bullet points and the bit buzzwords, focus on the change. Hi, thank you very much for your guidelines towards mastering collaboration. I'm interested in your opinion, could computers, AI, assistants, Siri, Alexa, be good collaborators? Uh, are we getting closer? What, how can we? Hmm, collaborating with Siri. I don't think we are anywhere close to that. Um, I mean, I do have a side gig of like thinking a little bit about designing for AI, and let's be clear, we don't have AI. We barely have some algorithms, some pretty primitive algorithms, and we've seen what they can do. Um, I think it's more about what can tools do to enable people to connect to people, and whether that's us as collaborators or us with um, customers, I think that's a better place to focus. I think that collaboration is going to be needed to address the things that AI brings us. Um, I love how the math people love to say, I can't tell you how the algorithm came up with that. The black box to me, I get it. I get that that's true of the math. But our users are going to start to demand, I call it the Sherlock Holmes. Oh, I can see if you're a caller. You're a lamplighter from Brixton and getting married on Tuesday, right? Like telling you a couple of indicators of how they got there so that you can judge whether it's appropriate or not. The, the wall of here's what everything Twitter or Facebook knows about you to target you in advertising, while transparent, not useful, right? So I think we're gonna have to get better at dealing with AI, but I, let's see if we can have it drive a car first. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Justin English, and the reason I introduce myself is that I'm old fashioned and I was raised to you always say your name before you speak, um, but at any rate, I love this stuff. I've managed teams before, and one of the things I always did was try and create functional dyads, right? So I would have two people, um, very often not co-located, because that was one of the ways we uh, dealt with um, geographic distribution, yep. right? Because otherwise the teams would silo on the different coasts and it would just drift. Um, and when I see all this stuff, it makes me you know, very excited, but it also, I think my experience has been much like yours and much like the gentleman speaking back there. Um, you know, there's the saying, strategy eats, <laughs> I'm sorry, culture eats strategy. strategy for breakfast. And I've seen that in action. So I guess um, I'm sort of curious how you talk to yourself in the morning, you know, <laughs> no, before, I mean, seriously, before you're going out to do this because a lot of times when we get into the corporate structures, you know, corporate structures are designed to be hierarchical, linear, you know, very programmatic and very restricted. And how do you, you know, prepare yourself for that battle every day? Um, I think you're doing the right thing. And by the way, you remind me of something that one of my professors said in graduate school. It's maybe Karl Popper, I don't know, but it was, um, ideas don't change because of data or research. Ideas change because the people who had the old ideas die off. So how much longer do we have to wait? <laughs> so yeah. please expound freely. I'd, l I'd love to hear it. Um, you know, just some of those general things, because I think that one of the hardest things for us to deal with is the you know, emotional management of the team and yeah. my experience keeping designers going in an enterprise tech company, my God, most of what I did was just, you know, keep my team saying, it's okay guys, Therapy. we're doing stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I'll take my answer off the mic. <laughs> um, I, I think in terms of pacing, like I do believe, like almost all of the big companies are coming around to valuing working differently. Yeah. Like digital transformation is a however big business it is. I'm McKinsey's into it because it's a big business. 
Um, so it, the, the intention is there. It's the inertia. It is the demographics. Um, and this is where I'm a big advocate of infecting pods of people, whether it's for people internally who perform well in a collaborative way or bringing in outsiders, whether they're agencies or hiring outside talent, to help balance that inertia. Like at PG&E, there's just so much inertia in the way things are done. It took us hiring 100 outside people and modeling totally different ways of being to start to change that. And then those people had to go out and infect more parts of the organization and it's still not gonna be a full sea change. So, you know, I would just like plan accordingly. You know, like I said, this is not Braveheart. You are not gonna win the war on your own in one try. Um, you know, in terms of like mental sanity, um, I think something that is uh, really hard about the Agile, like I'm a big fan of, of just broadly Agile, right? Doing things experimentally and iteratively, I'll just leave it at that. Um, I like it because it helps people keep the momentum and that's a key part of keeping sanity, like nothing drives a designer more crazy than working on one thing for three weeks and then going over here and like that's really destructive. Um, what it doesn't allow for is any breathing room. Like you're just kind of always grinding, 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 grinding. And so making sure you're building in for teams ups and downs, right? Whether it's let's, let's take a moment to celebrate the win when we got there. I don't mean everybody go to Hawaii, but maybe don't turn around right after that and be like, go on to the next thing. Like give yourself some planning time. Give yourself some time to wait for the data to come in to really make sure you had a win. Like I think being able to be really thoughtful about planning that. Now that I work on my own um, and I work out of my house a lot, I'm so much more sensitive to my own ups and downs and realizing how little I was aware of them when I'm surrounded by people. And like we notice it as creative people, or I notice it as like some days I have all the ideas. And some days I'm like, Ooh, I cannot. And how do you let teams have, have data, and that's what's good about a collaboration. So if I'm in a down period, what's the saying? When the muse comes, she better find you working. So you always have to be applying yourself, but in down times, I turn myself into a critic, into a documenter, into a story. I focus on things that are a little more analytical, a little more judgy, because I'm kind of in a less positive space. And when I feel the manic wave come on, I run around and write down ideas. And I think that probably happens for everybody. And I've, um, you know, I've had partnerships that are like in sync, and I've had them like this, and they both have their advantages. Um, yeah, I, I don't look at the double diamond. Right but I'll just say, I'll just respond to that by saying, um, I think that one of the er one of the early slides you showed um, was the one about colo versus remote and synchronous and asynchronous. And I think for me, I mean, I, I know my own psychological makeup. Um, I think I'm the person who might come back to you the next day. I wouldn't write you a seven page, a seven page email. I'd write you a seven sentence email with seven points in it. <laughs> but um, just giving people some of that uh, space to work in um, when we don't have the physical space, you know, giving them the temporal space would probably be awfully helpful. Yeah. But um, it's just interesting to me because I think you're doing really heavy lifting here. Thank and you know. <laughs> It's a lot to be done. <laughs> there is a lot to be done, right. And it's always the next thing. So congratulations. Uh, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I wrote the book because I can't do this on my own. I was like, we, we got to scale this business. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned that your students really dislike group work. And I find that one reason students are afraid of group work is that, you know, those there, there will always be that one person who doesn't quite, you know, pull their way. And in situations like that, I find that a lot of students, you know, this person isn't doing the work, so I'm just gonna do it for them. But in an organization or company, when you have someone, you work on like a cross-functional team, either it's PMs, engineers, designers, whoever it is, there's one person who isn't quite pulling your, their weight. What would you do in a situation like that to either get them involved more or collaborate more and work with everyone? Yeah, I think it depends on what your relationship is with that person, but like nobody wants to be that person. And so I think if you can, talk to them about what are you doing? Like, what would you rather be doing? Or how could you rather be helpful? Or we're covered over here. What can you do over there? 
sometimes that might be a conversation that you or someone else needs to have with that person's boss. And I don't mean a like, they're not pulling their weight. I mean like, hey, could we leverage this person better? Because it's not adding a net positive over here. And that's not to say anything bad about that person. Maybe that, that we don't have a role for that person. Um, I also, you know, sometimes you can get people like who are really sticky wickets to be, to literally be critics. Like there's always that person who you don't want in the brainstorming meeting because they're the like, yeah, but, no, but, can't, absolutely no way, tried that. And you're like, I want to kill myself or you. I like to just give that person the job of like, you are the critic. Like your job is to literally nitpick all of the ideas. And maybe not in the exact moment, but when we get to this part of the double diamond, right? We were expansive and now we're going to converge. Come on in. I want to hear all of the myriad reasons why this sucks and elevate them to what they're probably better at. And it's probably because they just are not good at the expansive thinking. And maybe they can get there. My experience is they can, but um, if it's not your job to do that, just use them for what they're good at. Um, yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. And how right you are about, you know, you listen more to people from the outside. I've been telling my husband for years that Pilates is brilliant and he's been ignoring me and then somebody else told him the other day and suddenly now he wants to do it. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> um, I've been thinking about the title of your book and all my experiences with various collaborations over the years. And I was thinking about how often I've found it's more successful if somebody is rather mastering it, they're masterminding it. Um, and whether you call that designing collaboration or contriving it. I don't know. Um, how important do you think it is to have somebody who somewhere, however subtly, is actually responsible to make collaboration successful? I think it's really important, and I, I kind of wrote the book with that person in mind. Um, I didn't call that out as like, this has to be a specific role, because that can be kind of problematic. But I think it is important for somebody to take on you know, the role of whether it's this navigator person or, you know, or, or maybe the manager of the people on the team who is really understanding the value of the collaboration and really there to, I mean, that was what I did at, at pg &E and other jobs I've had is I'm just the person providing air cover and white space, right? I'm, I'm making the environment better for the team to collaborate. And that's a pretty important thing. And so a lot of the takeaways I have are for people who are going to either be appointed or self-appoint them themselves as the facilitator of this, because um, it's, yeah, it's not just going to happen. And I think you could be more or less transparent with the team. Like some teams, I think if I went and was like, I'm going to facilitate a collaboration, I can imagine half of the room being like, ugh. You know, whereas if you just did it for a little while and everybody had, you know, think about the user experience of the collaboration almost that you want people to have. You want it to be fun and engaging and not overwhelming. And that's probably going to get you farther than like declaring yourself queen of the collaboration. Mm -hmm. Um, but you might declare yourself queen, queen and just not tell anybody. <laughs> Did anybody miss a turn? Ted. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I was thinking about um, a couple of things that are just a little difficult. Um, open, open offices. Um, it's gotten to the point where uh, I've been in various organizations where nothing gets done. And... And, you know, and everyone thinks they're collaborating. And then I was thinking to your point about um, project-based, uh, you know, team things in, in classes, and I got to the point where I refused to let people work except individually on projects, and I made them all collaborate on criti critiquing and supporting each other's learning about their individual mm -hmm. projects, and had much, much better success at getting them all to succeed and get amazing grades and do amazing projects than when they were in groups of twos and threes where they were delegating and blaming each other and, and so on. So I just, these two topics are interrelated to me about kind of, you know, when, when, is, when is collaboration false and, and what, you know, and maybe collaboration happens outside of what we say collaboration is or we can fake, we can fake collaboration and really waste a lot of resources. I think the example of um, create individually but critique together is actually a totally valid form of collaboration. It's really just an evolution of hash it out in the morning and then document it in the afternoon. Uh, maybe if people don't have the ability to do the hashing out part together. It's totally fine. I mean, for those of you that know the Google Sprint book, they talk about alone, alone together. 
right? We're, rather than trying to have people co-create literally on post-its right there, everyone draws their own thing and then you put them up and talk about them. Totally valid. Actually probably gonna get you more diverse stuff. What happens when everybody is literally messily arguing about post-its is you end up with the one idea, right? You, you need a pollen and ice cream, everything into the all singing, all dancing solution um, where you might get actually a better I say there's no idea, there's only ideas, because if you only have an idea, you don't have any way of evaluating it. <laughs> exactly, yes, yes. Um, and about the space thing, yeah, I mean, I personally like the open plan offices because I'm super gregarious and I think it's fun. Uh, I've read all the research and they're terrible. Um, and partially it's because it's forcing collaboration to happen all the time. And so I think even in that space, what you, you know, everyone's headphones is their version of cubicle. So that's, a, you know, as we use our researchers, we could look at that and go, huh, maybe we need to prioritize getting a war room for us to all go be together in so that even though we sit three inches from each other, we know that when we're at our desks, that is work time. That's my one solution to that. You know, I've seen people with like, if my red flag is up, they'll talk to me. Um, you know, artificial ways to keep up the cubicle walls. Terrific. Hi. Hi. I'm Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Thank you. Uh, so, something you said in about the middle of your talk stuck in my head, and that was the, something, to the, something like it needs to prove itself in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Is that something, is mm -hmm. that close to what you said? Okay. So, then that led me to a kind of a, a meta thought, uh, which is, do we have any evidence? Can we quantify the value, of the ROI, as it were, and put it in the latest uh, buzzword, of collaboration versus non-collaboration? I think in business, because let's admit it, that's, that's, we're not really talking about church here. Right. I, um, I'm trying to remember who said this. Was it Matt LeMay? I think it was Matt LeMay. It was like, you can't really talk about the ROI of collaboration because you don't have the counterexample. You don't have the A, B. You know, here's what would have happened if we didn't collaborate. So I think there is an element of like trusting that this, that you need to do the collaboration for it to work. And like I said, there's certainly plenty of situations where it is not needed. But I think when I talk about success in the market, it's more like, Regardless of how you got there, did the effort succeed? So like at PG&E, our job was to digitize <coughs> paper. The only metric we, were ever, we could ever really get to was, well, we shipped it. Because what things we really wanted to drive, like did we reduce the number of miles that people drove? Because that's a safety you know, and a cost center. Did we shorten the processing time for this thing? You know, those key metrics. We could articulate those and aim toward those. We had a real hard time measuring them. But by continuing to keep people focused on, we aren't just trying to ship this app. We, we, are, we want to find these signifiers out in the marketplace as evidence that what we're doing is right. We're gonna settle for, we shipped it, we're gonna settle for, users say they love it. But I never felt great about that, right? I always wanted to get to the next level of like, did I actually reduce the miles that people drove? So I'm reading from your response, the answer is no. I don't think you could prove the ROI of design. I think the okay. best you can do is say, we said we were going to get it up and to the right, mm -hmm. increase profit, whatever you said you were gonna do, yeah. and focus on that. Well, I think the problem with the mission, as it were, is that without being able to somehow quantify with evidence that it is has value it's going to continue to be catch as catch can in organizations see i yeah. i've i've studied this thing called tribal leadership uh -huh. it's out of a book you okay so you've heard of this and the idea is that uh, uh, organized business organizations evolve through various stages about half of which at stage three is the highly competitive stage where, you know, uh, it's characterized by the phrase, I'm great and you're not. <laughs> and the position of the book is that you want to transform your organization to a stage four where the catchphrase is, we're great, when they're not, because we're all human after all. And, uh, and they claim that 
orders of magnitude performance improvement from this transformation. But can they, can we rub any real science on it? Mm, it's kind of I like reading tea leaves. I think you're either going to collaborate because you believe it's going to help you or not. And if you aren't going to do that, like, hey, if you can pull it off on your own, go for it. Dude, it's easier. But more often what happens is that I, when I've seen this, like you get a product manager who just browbeats everybody into doing what they want, burns two years of social capital. Yeah, that's a, this is the power of stage three. It's responsible for the success of our modern business world because yeah. it's, the, it's the story of the 20th century. Yeah. But it's also fundamentally limiting. Yeah, it's just like, are you, if you want to go blow your social capital and then spend the next two years building it back up, have at it, my friend. I think you're going to get tired of that, and I think the people you work with are going to get tired with that, and you might not see success over time. Like, at some point, Elon Musk's ideas it depends start on the to organization. Suck, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if you can do it on your own, God bless. Well, let's, let's pause here and thank our speaker and thank all of you for showing up. Thank you.